ancestors and in celebration of our African history, we have asked the neighbors ask you to join us in our opening ritual. To honor our elders who are those Africans, 60 years of age and old, please stand. To honor African life, will the sister bearing her life in a sacred African womb please stand? <laughs> will those Africans join us for the first time? Please stand so that we can welcome you into our African Echoes family. Okay. Continuing the ritual, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer. A day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he's a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a shame, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity, your songs of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious praise and solemnity, solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil which would cover up crimes, which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world, travel through South America, search with every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts by the side of everyday practices of this nation, and you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. Frederick Douglass, Rochester, New York, July the 5th, 1852. Question, has anything changed? No, uh, I know Dr. Lois will be here, but I think he's been caught up in traffic. You know, a number of position, irrespective of what he will say. And you know, to keep it with Dr. Ben is not an easy job. <laughs> it's not an easy job. So, I mean, for him to be worrying about Dr. Ben Worrying about his family and worrying about Africa is not an easy job. And I think this brother here and his family, he has a beautiful wife, sister who works with us all the time. And you know, he has a family. For the amount of work that this brother has put in, we can never repay him. And it's brothers like this who are committed, who are sincere, who are hard work. And the brother is very modest. He'll come here and dismiss everything I've said. But it has to be known, and we are grateful and we are thankful to brothers like uh, Dr. Lewis. So sisters and brothers, let's welcome our brother, Dr. Arthur Lewis. Yeah. What I want to do with me is give everybody, I think they're 20, 18 or something, there. And uh, so everybody can get there. What I'd like to give you a little update on Dr. Ben at this particular point. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Ben is coming by airplane from North Carolina. He's supposed to be uh, arriving in LaGuardia about 7 o'clock p.m. And he's been in North Carolina over the weekend down giving a lecture in Raleigh. Uh, previous weekend, Dr. Ben was in uh, St. Louis. He uh, was giving a lecture in St. Louis there. Dr. Ben travels by himself now after he had the stroke. And next weekend, he's going to be honored in Washington, D.C. Uh, by uh, Break the Chain Study Group. So at this point, Dr. Ben is traveling by himself. He has made some basic changes that I, I, I believe that he wouldn't mind us telling about. He has gotten a lot of stress off of himself because, you know, as it relates to your health, and we'll give you some more 
health bulletins. When we deal with health, we say 50% of your health is mental because stress and tension has a lot to do with how your body works. And then we say 25% of your health is exercise. It's important exercise to circulate the nutrients and take away the toxin. And then we say approximately 15% of your health is what you eat, the quality of your food, and what's most important uh, in this society is to eat organic so that you will stop the pesticides and other uh, chemicals from getting into your body. And then 10%, we say, is nutrients, like the ginkgo biloba, dilate the blood vessels, and the Q10, and the vitamins, etc. So I haven't worked with Dr. Bing. He has adopted all of these uh, procedures to bring himself back to health. So in the last two or three months, he has reduced a lot of his stress factors have gone away. Dr. Bing eats organic now. <laughs> And, and uh, he has essentially eliminated meat, especially the pork. And the reason behind it is after we explain to Dr. Ben the import of what is happening to the meats. Okay. So he's elimin he has reduced the stress. He has changed the diet in terms of eliminating animals, primarily animal fats. He exercises. If you go to his house in the morning, you'll see him walk, walking around at least one or two miles a day. He walks every morning, Dr. Ben. And he takes, he takes all of his nutrients, his vitamins, his herbs, and teas. When you see Doc, he has made a radical change because he realizes that in order to maintain and hold his health, these changes have to be put in place. If not, he was uh, very sick and he was going the other way. So um, you will see a major change in the region that we, he made the change, and we'll bring you more information, is what they're doing to the foods. It's not so much that animal fats per se are bad, whether it's pork or beef or chicken. It is, in this particular country right now, it is what they're putting in to process the animals. Uh, when they process the animals, you'll get uh, pesticides. You'll, they give animals uh, growth hormones. They give them steroids to make them grow. They give them Prozac. They give them rendering. So for instance, and I'll just tell you quickly, and then we'll go on to the lecture. If you eat chicken, let's say, when they raise that chicken, the chicken are put in tight coops. And in order to, to make the chicken grow fast, they give them steroids. So when you eat these meats, you eat the steroids in the meat, and you retain water. That's why meat eaters carry a lot of water. So that chicken now has steroid in the meat to retain water to fatten them up. Then they give them growth hormone. Then they give them steroids. Then the food and stuff that they feed them are pesticides. And then uh, they, have, they feed the chicken like all meat, rendered. What is rendering? Rendering is when you feed an animal, animal protein. So what rendering means is this. They go around every morning and collect all the cows that have died that morning, all the sheep, all the pigs, all the animals on the farm. They collect them up and put them in the truck. Then they drive along the road, pick up all the dead animals on the road, fox and bears and deers. Then they go to the ASPCA, take all those dead animals from the ASPCA. They take them and they put them in and they grind them up. And they mix it with soybean and corn. So now there's a cheap source of protein. That's called rendering. So any meat you eat in this country that's not range free, whether it's pork, it's chicken, beef or whatever it is, that's how they process it. And, it. and the chickens, because the chickens peck each other, they used to cut the beak and they bled, but they had to get another method by which they can sedate these chickens. So what they feed them is Prozac. So if you eat chicken, you're getting Prozac. In addition to kill them, they gas them. So after explaining this to Dr. Ben and how it relates to the health and stuff, he began to understand and make the change. So that's how the politics of meat come in. So he's made a radical change. So again, as I said, Doc has made those necessary changes. He has restored his health. He's in physically good health. He's in mental health. He's getting stronger every day. And again, as I said, indicated, uh, we have reduced his medicine by over 50 percent. And they want to know, the doctors want to know, what has he been doing? And the testament, again, is Doc is coming from North Carolina by himself. He's coming in LaGuardia about 7. He's been to um, St. Louis last week. He's going to Washington, D.C. this weekend. 
We're scheduling to put them into uh, the Virgin Islands, probably the middle of uh, July, and then you know he has his trip to Egypt. So he's so far he's in good health. So these are some of the things we have to discuss on how we have to maintain our health and also at optimal. What I want to do now is to um, deal with what we call the world economic order. And in this world economic order, what we have done is we have taken and given you three pages which comprises a handout. And this handout deals, the first page on the handout deals with a schematic uh, as it relates to the world economic order. Let's just say the world economic order as it exists today. And the second page is a compilation of a number of different articles that I removed from some of the papers in the United States, the New York Times and some financial uh, magazines, so that I wanted to use the sources from the United States so you can hear and see what the people who run this economy are thinking. Not that they're necessarily right or wrong, but you have to get an idea of what they're talking about and what they're thinking. And then on the third page, what we have done is broken down to you the schematic of what happened to South Korea in particular, but what happens to all of the countries now in the IMF system. And what I would like to do uh, for five minutes is to see if I can take the first page and schematically put it down on this blackboard if I uh, have some chalk. I'm going to write on this one until we get it here. Because what I want to do is we want to, um, we want to go over it schematically so we can follow it. And the purpose of this is just to expose you to some information so that we can get an idea of what it is we're dealing with. And as we begin to um, analyze this, we can begin to see those pieces of information that are needed by us so that we can better understand what is going on around us. And then we're going to discuss it. And what I'd like to do is present the material to you. And after presenting the material, then we can have a question and answer period around it. And maybe we can expand on it in a little more detail there. And what this is is a schematic that reflects what actually has happened and what is happening. This is not a schematic that I put together from some hypothetical uh, theory or formula that I want to work out of, and therefore this is uh, what he says. Now, in order to look at the world economic order, let's look at the first page, and you notice on your first page in your upper left-hand corner there's some information here. And what does it say? It says raw materials, labor, and technology. Because it is raw materials, labor, and technology that make a community run, makes a country run, and make the world run. Stock and bonds and, and futures and all these derivatives don't make the world run. You have to have human beings digging the soil, planting crops, harvesting the crops, digging up mines, converting metal from the, from the oxides into metal, and making things. So that's what makes the world run. That's why we start with raw material, labor, and technology. Then uh, let's go to number one. Number one is colonialism. In order for you to understand what is happening to you or the so-called world economic order today, we've got to go back at least 500 years minimum. And in that 500 years, we're going to deal with colonialism. And if you notice, colonialism is noted here. And we put an arbitrary date of 1500 to 1945. And, and that's label number one. You notice number two is labeled what? Raw materials, labor, and technology. Why do we indicate that? Because of colonialism, the ability in this case of white people, European, predominantly from Western Europe, England, France, Germany, Spain, and Portugal primarily. These countries around 1500 to 1945, because of a number of reasons, they were successful in leaving Europe and beginning to conquer and bring other people under their control and taking their land. And in the process of colonialism, to go into a country, to take one's natural resources, to use the labor of one's persons, and to use the technology, it was this process that made what you call the United States, what you call Western Europe, and later Japan, 
strong economic countries in the 1900s. So let's look at number two, raw materials. They come to America, let's say they come to Africa, they take your wood, they take your minerals and your food. By bringing these raw materials back to Europe, they're able to now eat well, they're able to build their homes, they're able to build factories. And of course we know about the labor, the free labor that the Europeans and America use in which to build up this country. African people, you know, in synopsis, built the roads here, they built the levees for the river, they planted the food, they planted uh, the, the cotton, they harvested the cotton. And why is the, why is the raw material labor important? Because what was the foundation of the so-called industrial revolution that you read about in the educational system here? The foundation of the industrial revolution is when? Is when America and Western Europe begins to so-called build up industrially. And that building up industrially was based on what? The raw materials taken primarily from the Caribbean first and then from Africa. It was, found, it was fueled by the physical labor of Africans. Unskilled labor and skilled labor. Africans, when they took, went to Africa, they didn't take out unskilled labor. They took out individuals, farmers who, could, who knew how to plant corn, who knew how to plant rice, who knew how to plant those agricultural products that you find in the Caribbean. So they would take your labor, skill and unskill, and from this skilled labor, they will begin to build America and they will begin to build Europe. So you now know they're taking your raw materials, they got your labor, skill and unskill, and your technology. What is some of the foundation of the so-called Industrial Revolution is what? Textiles and chemicals. Well, you know the African people have been weaving all kind of textile products, cloth, so not only have we been weaving it, but we have had in our possession for thousands of years the technology of weaving. All those weaving looms and machines that you find that in the textile mills in America and the textile mills in Europe, they came from Africa. The exact prototype, the exact machines were taken, so when they went and raided, not only did they pull you away, pull your scientists away, pull your, your, your people away, but they took your machines. And it was those machines that would go in to make the spinning gin here and all these inventions here. So they transferred from us not only the raw material, not only our physical body and the labor, but they transferred the technology. That technology transfer primarily from Africa to the Caribbean, America, and Europe is what started the so-called Industrial Revolution for European and white people, your textile. And we can go back to metallurgy where the uh, Industrial Revolution was when the Europeans began to learn how to make steel and how to smell to get aluminum and copper. But you can go back to any part of Africa, West Africa, and you can see where we were smelting iron and brass and copper and tin and silver. Or you can go along the Nile. If you go to the trip with Dr. Ben, you will see where the Africans have worked in gold and silver and copper and bronze and platinum. So it's well documented that those industrial processes in metals that made the Industrial Revolution here came from the continent, the textiles, the textile industry, and all of the technology primarily came. It was the ability to, for three or four hundred years, to drain from you your labor, your technology, and your resources that made America and Europe what it was. And if you go through the scenario, you would see Lords of London, all of these big insurance houses in America and Europe, and uh, didn't come into existence until after this process has occurred. So that's the foundation. So when you look at Lloyds of London and Citibank and National Bank and Carnegie, where did the foundation come from? It came from number two. Your raw material, your technology, and your resources used to make Europe or white people in Western Europe strong and powerful. So there's almost nothing that you can look at in America where you can directly see where it came from this process. And that's why what brings America and Western Europe into 1900 a dominant economic power, dominant military power, relative to the African, the Asians, and the brothers and sisters and others in the Caribbean. So when you're talking about the, the world economic world, you have to go back at least to that portion of colonialism. That's the foundation of the wealth of Europe and America. We're not going to deal with the white people from Eastern Europe, because those white human beings called Russians went over the Ural Mountains heading west and equally did to those Asians what the Western Europeans did to us. So you had the white people split in two halves. Those you call Western Europeans, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, German, they left. 
They conquered what you call America, the Caribbean, and Africa, and the Pacific. But another, the other half of them, those white Russians, crossed the Ural Mountain from 1300 and began to conquer what is now parts of Pakistan, India, China, and they kill off and exterminated those people in Asia you call Eskimos, Ainus, people of color. That's how Russia got its power and its strength. So you had two parallels. But here we're going to deal with the Western part. So as you begin to, and if you look at the map here, what we're saying is those Europeans from Western Europe came out in this portion and went in this direction. But you also had white people calling themselves Russians who after 1300 began to cross the Ural Mountains. And in the age of conquest, what they were doing to us here, what they did was these white Russians went and conquered these Asian people, the Iranians, the Pakistanis, the Mongolians, the Iranians, and others, and they, those white Russians from 1300 to present, conquered Asia. They came out of Asia and they went across and conquered Alaska, and the Russians were trying to and almost conquer Hawaii. So you had a dual conquest on both ends. So anyone who tells you that the Soviet Union is your friend, as European, look at the history, you see that's nonsense. Okay, so as we go on, you see the foundation. Now we go to number three. And number three is labeled trilateral. And the trilateral we just means there are three sides. And since 1900, when white as Europeans got together, they formed different organizations that they needed to project themselves. And the U word trilateral just means three sides. And, and the, the three sides of the trilateral commission, and we'll expand on it later, is United States and Canada is one side. Western Europe is the second side. And they added Japan as the third side. Trilateral Commission was instituted about 1975. And they represent those countries who formerly had colonies and who band together to form colonies, band together to become strong. Let's go back briefly to see who the English are, the Spanish, the English, and the Germans. When you look at the history of Europe, approximately 400 AD, a group of Europeans coming from the northern part of Europe, which you call Scandinavia, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, and what you call Russia and Denmark, they came down in a series of invasions starting at 400 AD, and they smashed the Roman Empire. These invasions continued to push 500 AD, 600, 700, 800, 900, and they kept pushing down into Central Europe. When these groups of people who were beginning this invasion, they're called Germanic people. They will come in and exterminate the Europeans who were presently there, which were primarily Romans and Celts. Those Europeans you call Germanic people. One, three sets of these German people would go into what is now England or Great Britain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. England and Great Britain was previously occupied by a group of Europeans called Celts, mm -hmm. who are now survived as the Irish, the Scottish, the Welsh. Mm -hmm. So those Germans invaded into the, what you call England. The three groups that invaded the German groups are Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. They will come in and invade what you call England and exterminate the, the Irish or the Celts. You, their name will change into Englishmen. Mm -hmm. And when these Englishmen come to America, the name of these people will change to Americans. So the point that I'm going to point out to you, and you see this scheme, that Americans are Englishmen. Englishmen are Germans. They're Jews, Angles, and Saxons, no different than Hitler. So let's clear in your mind about who these Europeans are, you call an American. They come from Germany. Two groups went into France, two German groups, the Burgundians and Franks. They exterminated most of the Celts there and what Africans were there, and they are now called Frenchmen. So Frenchmen are Germans. Another group, two groups went into northern Italy and northern Spain. They are called the Visigoths and Vandals. Those white English, the white Spanish, and the white Italian, the white from Yugoslavia, they're Germans. Another group of Germans would move to the West. That group is called the Rus, R-U-S. They will comprise your white Russian. 
your Boris Yeltsin's. So let's get a, a, a frame of reference historically clear that those Europeans who now you recognize as Englishmen, Americans, Germans, French, Spanish, Italian, Russians, they're all Germans. Racially, they are the same, there's no distinction. So don't mix them up about one of your colonizers is better than the other. Okay. It is these Germans, when they were able to occupy and conquer and control all of Europe, when they were able to kill off the Celts, push the Moors out, push the Arabs out from Yugoslavia and push the Turks out, and they finally got control of Europe in its entirety. They fought each other from that point. 